Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Peter Husey. I'm Director of Strategic Deterrence Studies here at the Mitchell Institute, and welcome to our National Security Administration Nuclear Deterrence Forum, which is a joint effort of the Mitchell Institute of Aerospace Studies and the Advanced Nuclear Weapons Alliance Deterrence Center. We are very pleased today that Mr. Jim McConnell and Mr. Bob Raines could join us. Mr. McConnell is the Associate Administrator for Safety, Infrastructure, and Operations at NSA, where he's responsible for overall NNSA safety activities, operations, and programs for the nuclear security enterprise. Mr. Raines is the Associate Administrator for Acquisition and Project Management at NNSA, and he is also a retired military, having served 27 years in the Navy's Civilian Engineer Corps. Welcome, gentlemen. And before we introduce uh, you for your remarks, we have a short presentation presented by Jeff Crater of the Advanced Nuclear Weapons Alliance Deterrence Center. Uh, over to you, sir. Again, thanks for the introduction, Peter. Um, and th thanks to all of you for, uh, for joining us today for our NSA forum uh, on its modernization efforts. Uh, we're pleased that uh, we're in excess of 190 of you were able to uh, sign up today. Uh, I'm Jeff Crater. I'm, I'm joined by uh, my colleague and co-founder, uh, David Charrington, who with Peter will ask our panelists some questions before turning it over to you in the audience. Um, we, um, that's David and I co-founded the Advanced Nuclear Weapons Alliance and these Associated Deterrence Center forums um, as a bipartisan um, environment to educate the public and interested parties about the key issues around the modernization of our nation's strategic nuclear deterrent. Uh, we're pleased to partner uh, with the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies to bring you this fifth forum in a six-part series on NSA. Uh, and But before uh, uh, turning it over to our, our distinguished speakers, I'd like to offer a, a, just a brief primer on uh, the question, why, why deterrence? Well, it's, it's important, uh, I believe, in this age of information and unfortunately also disinformation to make sure that each of us really educate ourselves by seeking a wide variety of sources on deterrence and to learn what our friends and foes are doing to modernize their deterrent. It all begins and ends at uh, NNSA with its nuclear weapons complex across our national nuclear weapons laboratories and manufacturing facilities and suppliers. It's, and it's also critical we continue to modernize this massive infrastructure for if, if we don't, we will weaken our deterrent and bring its credibility to question. The more you sweat in peace, the less you bleed in war. That's from Admiral Rickover, father of the nuclear Navy, in a 1983 speech uh, he gave, which I think really helps capture the essence of strategic nuclear deterrence. There was a time in our recent uh, history when tens of millions of people died because we lacked an overarching deterrent. That was World War II, of course. 70 million people perished. Some estimate as high as 150 million people. Our strategic nuclear deterrent prevents tens of millions more from death. In other words, World War III. Deterrence stood us well uh, during the Cold War, and it's evolved in the last 30 years since the end of the Cold War buildup. In those remarkable words, President Reagan standing before the Berlin Wall in June of 1987 said, President Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Well, the wall collapsed in 1989, and by 19 1991, uh, the Soviet Union had collapsed in autonomous uh, republics, ending the Cold War. And in the United States, deterrence personnel were downsized. I witnessed this uh, personally uh, while I was at the Department of Energy. And, and nuclear weapons production uh, halted, including uh, nuclear weapons materials like highly enriched uranium and plutonium, uh, ordered by uh, President H.W. Bush on July 13, 1992. This sealed the fate of plutonium pit manufacturing at the Rocky Flats plant in, in Colorado. Cold War downsizing under, under Bush went forward under Clinton. And you can see what the Rocky Flats plant looked like in 1995 under Clinton compared to his cleanup end state uh, in 2005 under George W. Bush. This shuttered the plutonium manufacturing capability uh, was then moved to Los Alamos. And now we're trying to reconstitute and construct a modern pit a manufacturing facility at the Savannah River site in South Carolina. So moving on from the relatively peaceful and prosperous 1990s, 9-11 hit America. Terrorism, terrorism had struck the United States. The nation mourned, 
and the counterterrorism and military buildup started overseas. Modernization of our strategic nuclear deterrent was put on the back burner. And so it goes, while America and our allies fought global terrorism, and rightly so, China and Russia modernized their nuclear forces. But starting under Obama and doubling down under Trump, with bipartisan support from Congress, we've stopped kicking the can on strategic nuclear deterrence modernization. We're on a 30-year, $1.2 trillion trajectory to maintain and modernize our deterrent, replacing the B-2s by continuing to fly B-52s with the air launch cruise missile and in the future, the long-range standoff missile, because frankly, B-52s lack the stealthy capability. We'll replace both uh, with new B-21 starting in 2030, running through about 2050. Plus, we're adding nuclear-capable F-35s. On land, we're replacing the Minuteman III with a new ground-based strategic deterrent and modern ICBMs. And at sea, 14 Ohio-class submarines with 12 new Columbias with upgraded Trident to D-5 missiles. NSA has been uh, modernizing really throughout the decade, but much more, much, much more needs to be done at the weapons plants and national laboratories to maintain, and in many, many cases, restore our capability, restore really what we've let atrophy since the wall fell, that is to manufacture nuclear materials and the warheads themselves. So today, this is the consolidated nuclear weapons complex stretching across the lower 48 from west to east. We have the national laboratories of Lawrence Livermore in Sandia in California. You've got Los Alamos and Maine Sandia in New Mexico, and then the Nevada National Security Site, which I grew up, uh, which I knew as uh, growing up as the Nevada Test Site, uh, which stands ready uh, to test should the need arise. Right now, uh, we re rely on laboratories' extensive stockpile, uh, science-based stockpile uh, stewardship through the inertial confinement fusion and computer modeling avoiding underground testing. We also rely on other national laboratories not pictured here like Pacific Northwest National Lab for strategic materials and other expertise. Well, Los Alamos has been the default plutonium pit manufacturing site, as I mentioned before, but we're gearing up to have manufacturing at Savannah River, which also has the treaty emission. And Y-12 is the center of HEU manufacturing and other strategic materials. All these manufacturing centers and laboratory expertise feed Pantex, where weapons are assembled, disassembled and surveilled, uh, working with the tri-labs to ensure that the weapons design is holding up so they know the work as design. So we're at the dawn of a new era, uh, reconstituting the infrastructure and capabilities of their cornerstone of our strategic nuclear deterrent. Now the good news is that we, we're making a lot of progress on modernization. Um, here's a shot of uh, the Y-12 uranium processing facility under construction, the core highly enriched uranium manufacturing facility for the warheads. We look forward to learning more on the weapons complex modernization efforts uh, like this one from our two outstanding NSA speakers. Peter, back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Jeff. I appreciate it. Now to kick off our session, I'd like to invite Mr. McConnell to speak to us about the state of NNSA's infrastructure, its impact on nuclear readiness and the steps NNSA is taking to improve its infrastructure in line with the direction from the 2018 Nuclear Posture Review. And Jim, I'm turning it over to you, sir. Welcome. All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone. It is truly a pleasure to be here with you virtually. Uh, as, as you heard, I'm Jim McConnell. I'm the Associate Administrator in the Office of Safety, Infrastructure and Operations, which is the programmatic owner for operating and maintaining and recapitalizing general purpose infrastructure, uh, which in, in some regards is the, the backbone of, of all of the laboratories, plants and sites. Uh, but before I go any further, I just want to, want to think, you know, many of you have heard that the, the second use of the acronym NNSA is the the National Nuclear Submariners Administration, and and I do want to to, to bring in as as a former nuclear submariner, so uh, you know my my ties to the to the Navy also. I I am proud to work here at NNSA in our diverse national security mission. Um, NNSA has accomplished many great things in our history, dating back to 1942 and the Manhattan Project. However, in, in a lot of ways, the workload we are facing today is as challenging as any time in several decades. And a significant part of that challenge is infrastructure. 
that the 2018 Nuclear Posture Review provided a realistic vision and view of the world and the United States is confronting an international security situation that is more complex and demanding than any since the end of the Cold War. Our strategic deterrent, which is a response to that, obviously consists of nuclear weapons, nuclear delivery systems, but it also includes the capability to sustain and modernize them. So in a very real sense, infrastructure is a essential element of deterrence. The NPR said it best, and I quote here, an effective, responsive, and resilient nuclear weapons infrastructure is essential to the U.S. capacity to adapt flexibly to shifting requirements. As, as we all know, in the past, the resources to maintain NNSA's infrastructure did not keep pace with our mission requirements. And therefore, as again, as the 2018 Nuclear Posture Review states, there is now no margin for further delay in recapitalizing the physical infrastructure needed for U.S. nuclear weapons. Clearly, the mission of an NSA requires safe, reliable, resilient, and modern infrastructure to meet immediate and long-term needs. This includes everything from large, one-of-a-kind, high-security and high-hazard facilities, which my colleague Bob Rains will discuss, all the way to roads and sewers and parking garages, which, believe it or not, I find exciting. I want to make sure that to, to acknowledge where we are at this particular point in time, the increased investment in NSA's infrastructure that we've enjoyed for the last few years represents critical and tangible proof of America's commitment to modernizing and recapitalizing, recapitalizing our nuclear security enterprise. But, but make no mistake, the challenge is significant. NNSA's infrastructure is extensive, complex, and in many critical areas, more than half a century old. To give you a sense of how extensive our infrastructure is, let me just give you a few interesting statistics. NNSA manages about 3 points, excuse me, 36 million square feet of active facility space. That's about the equivalent of six pentagons. We owe, own and operate about 2,100 square miles of land, roughly the size of Delaware. And we consume 8.6 trillion BTUs of energy annually, which is enough power to light a small city of 231,000 homes for a year. 60% of NNSA's facilities are beyond their life expectancy of nominally 40 years, and nearly 40% are judged to be in poor condition, and I'll explain more about that in a few minutes. Many of NNSA's nuclear security enterprise critical production, utility, safety, and support systems are at or are already starting to fail. By the end of 2019, the latest year we have information, NNSA's total replacement plant value was about $120 billion. And of that, we had a deferred maintenance on those assets of about $5 billion. So understandably, addressing this legacy while building for the future requires significant sustained and timely funding, robust planning and execution, and close collaboration with Congress and the Department of Defense. We did not get into this situation overnight, and we will not get out of it quickly either. Success will require sustained, predictable, and timely investments to restore and modernize our infrastructure that will allow us to deliver our promise of a safe and reliable nuclear weapons stockpile. I also must point out it's equally important for our goal, global nuclear security mission, of preventing, countering, and responding to nuclear and radiological proliferation and emergencies. So how are we modernizing our infrastructure? Well, recognizing our significant infrastructure needs, in 2018 in particular, Congress gave NNSA new infrastructure authority to both streamline and improve our delivery of minor construction projects, the portfolio that I mostly manage, to, to acquire new facilities, and also strengthened our ability to deal with excess facilities, those large, in many cases, facilities that 
are now surplus to our need, but still take up valuable space and present a risk to our ongoing operations. This authority has been expanded at NNSA to help collaborate along with the Office of Environmental Management uh, in the department who, who has a responsibility for the most significant of those kinds of facilities. Since NSA has gotten this authority, what have we done with it? Well, we've developed and implemented tools, and I'll discuss those tools in more detail in a minute, to facilitate a science-based infrastructure stewardship approach to better pinpoint and maximize benefits of investments to reduce risks. We've increased annual maintenance investments by more than 40% to reduce our deferred maintenance. We've dispositioned and got rid of 16 old facilities and we have 24 uh, excess facility disposition underway and requesting more every year. We started piloting several new initiatives to streamline processes and increase NNSA's buying power and accelerate the delivery of low-risk commercial light construction projects. Using science-based infrastructure stewardship tools, life cycle management principles, and comprehensive and advanced planning, we are reducing the risks, building increased capacity, and improving the condition of the infrastructure. Funding increases have been and will continue to be essential to modernizing NNSA's infrastructure increasing productivity and improving safety, eliminating costly compensatory measures, and shrinking the NNSA footprint to the disposition of unneeded facilities. Through informed investment decisions to modernize and sustain the nuclear security enterprise in support of our current and future missions, we can reduce the risk posed by this aging infrastructure that is present for our workforce, the environment, and our mission. And our strategy is working. With support from the administration and Congress, NNSA is undertaking a risk-informed infrastructure recapitalization effort and is making progress in repairing and replacing NNSA's facilities. We've developed and implemented an annual NNSA infrastructure roadmap to chart out and communicate our path forward. And, and we also use that to describe our successes in the recent past. Just since 2015, NSA has completed over 295 infrastructure recapitalization projects at the minor construction level. We've dispositioned 56 facilities and we've executed $1.7 billion of maintenance across the nuclear security enterprise. We've also made commitments for important milestones that are coming in the near future. In 2019, the NNSA's administrator, Lisa Gordon Haggerty, developed a strategic integrated roadmap for our enterprise with infrastructure and modernization listed as one of the five major mission priorities. The major future milestones from that roadmap include completing the NNSA Albuquerque complex for our federal employees in 2022, reducing deferred maintenance by 30% by 2025, modernizing utilities across all our sites by 2028, and finalizing construction and modernization of 10 million gross square feet of office and laboratory space by 2043. In my office, the Office of Infrastructure, Safety Infrastructure and Operations is taking on several strategic initiatives to try and, and improve our, our ability to bring these important initiatives to fruition. One of the challenges facing NNSA is with its investing in mission enabling infrastructure is to ensure proper risk prioritization within NNSA's missions and other needs. Infrastructure risks are generally considered to be high consequence, low probability events, making mission, enable infra mission enabling infrastructure investments a natural offset for short term requirements. However, NNSA's mission-enabling infrastructure, such as offices, parking lots, cafeterias, general laboratory space, warehouses, things like that, are vital to achieving NNSA's mission and form the backbone of the national nuclear security enterprise of which our critical missions rely. Mission-enabling infrastructure modernization is also vital to recruiting and retaining our work, world-class workforce. Reliable and flexible mission enabling infrastructure is needed for optimizing workflow and meeting growing mission needs. 
A current example of that is, is the need for general purpose infrastructure along with the programmatic investment for plutonium pit production at Los Alamos. Overall, NNSA will need approximately 5 million square feet of modern office and laboratory space over just the next 10 years, and approximately 10 million square feet over the next 20 years. The challenge is that this will take time and money. So what are we doing to meet that challenge? We're creating innovative ways to streamline processes, accelerate delivery, increase our buying power, and reduce the risk that we infrastructure poses to our mission success. Just a few examples of these are our recent initiative, which we call the Standardized Acquisition and Recapitalization Initiative, or STAR. Uh, here in NNSA, if you have a, a, a good acronym, you're halfway up to, to success. Uh, STAR was created in, in May of 2019 to reduce costs and accelerate construction of small office and light laboratory facilities. We've created a library of successful minor construction facilities, which allows us to share conceptual design for common facilities and structures and accelerate the early parts of our project for these low risk facilities. We've coupled that with an enhanced minor construction and commercial practice pilot, which is focused right now at four facilities that are above the minor construction, construction threshold of the that are therefore line items, but are, are not the high risk, one of a kind, unique facilities that Bob will be describing in, in a few minutes. These are very simple buildings that we use for fire stations and emergency operating centers at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, uh, Sandia National Laboratories, and the Y-12 National Security Complex. We, we are, to the best of our ability, across the entire uh, level of and, and types of activities to acquire these facilities using commercial practices and trying to avoid the typical DOE speak that sometimes results in, quite honestly, scaring away bidders or, or new potential partners in our, in our efforts because they're, they're more aware and familiar with normal activities like occupational safety and health administration requirements and are less familiar with the unique systems that we have in place, like 10 CFR 851, which is our worker health and safety rule. Um, we've also created a small project working group to address, address multiple recommendations to develop strategies for deeper engagement with the private industry and improve collaboration across the various sites in the planning and execution of minor construction. Supply chain and the use of the well-developed NNSA supply chain management system was very important to that. The working group is currently collaborating with the supply chain management system to develop new acquisition vehicles for our MNO partners to obtain services through a centralized acquisition system. The first of these vehicles was engineering services, which we awarded to nine companies in March of 2020. The next one we're working on is a contract for construction escorts which was awarded in 2020, in August of 2020. And let me just stop there real quick. I mean, some people might think, wow, why are you worried about contracts for escorts? Well, we have lots of projects going on, and a lot of those projects are inside our security gate. And so the, the, the construction contractors and general uh, engineering firms that we contract with need to be escorted in order to do their work. And the cost and availability of those escorts, those people who already have the clearances, is no small part of our ability to make sure that we can, with high reliability and confidence, predict the schedule of things and make sure that we can optimize the use of these special but uncleared workforce. So, so in our world, things like that turn out to be pretty important. Uh, as we'll put a plug in that the supply working group will be holding an industry in November next month to engage a select group of construction industry representatives for the purpose of generating more innovative solutions and to increase our supplier participation in NNSA's infrastructure related procurements. So overall, I think it's an exciting time, at least for people like me, 
who are called on to get creative and productive to support the great men and women who do the hard work of providing our strategic deterrence. I think we are literally getting better and we're getting better faster and cheaper. So in closing, I'd, I'd like to thank you for allowing me to take the time to discuss these important national security issues with you. And I'm gonna turn it over now to NNSA's Associate Administrator for Acquisition and Project Management, Bob Raines, who will discuss the sexy stuff. Oh. Thank you, Jim. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today about the Office of Acquisition and Project Management and our role in supporting the National Nuclear Security Administration's mission of ensuring a safe, secure, and reliable nuclear deterrent, preventing nuclear proliferation, and powering our nuclear Navy. Before I discuss some of the major project NNSA is working on, I think it's important to discuss the improvements we have made in delivering our large construction projects. Much was written in the past about NNSA's poor record in delivering major construction. Unfortunately, these reports were an accurate representation of poor outcomes whose root causes were embedded in inadequate policies, processes, and organizational alignments. The NNSA took these challenges seriously and across three administrators committed to implementing solutions to address those root causes. Recognizing that a revolutionary, not evolutionary change was needed to change course, NNSA created the Office of Acquisition and Project Management in 2011 to improve delivery of its high value complex construction project portfolio. This new organization was modeled after the Department of Defense and other public and private sector project deliver delivery models. APM reported directly to the administrator having direct line accountability for contract management and project delivery. APM's vision was to create a professional acquisition and project management organization to deliver safe quality construction on schedule and on budget. At its core, the APM delivery model codified that project requirements and budgets were program office responsibilities, and it realigned project estimating, acquisition approaches, construction and management to the newly formed Office of Acquisition and Construction Management. Before committing to cost and schedule baselines, designs would now be sufficiently complete for estimating with a high degree of certainty. In the event new technologies were being considered, they had to be proven early enough in the schedule to incorporate into the design. We hired experienced construction professionals, developed outcome-based contracts, and critically evaluated a project's definition, cost estimate, design and technical maturity, and put in place contracts with appropriate incentives to bring the best players to the table and accountability to make sure the taxpayer's interests were met if we were not able to deliver. We would break large projects into smaller sub-projects, allowing the critical nuclear design work to continue while supporting infrastructure could be constructed. This would improve schedule and cost performance. This new project delivery strategy allowed us to maintain schedule for defense programs and other clients, allowed us to manage their cash flows, prevented us from baselining the complex nuclear work before designs were complete, which invariably led to significant cost and schedule growth. In 2013, I had the opportunity to testify in front of the House Energy and Water Subcommittee to lay out these goals, the changes already implemented, and some of the progress we had made. During that testimony, then ranking member, now sub subcommittee chair Captor said, quote, I like the rigor of the way that sounds. I hope in the implementation phase it works out that way. And I didn't think about it so much then, but she basically threw down the gauntlet saying, I'm a little skeptical, Bob, but let's see how it turns out. Well, seven years later, we can report that it is working out. We have completed 23 projects valued at over $2.2 billion on schedule and under budget. And while it's easy for me to say these things, what's more important is what the outside stakeholders and oversight organizations have to say. Here's a small sample. 
In 2013, the GAO removed NNSA from its high-risk list for contract and project management for all work up to $750 million, and those are big projects. We have stayed off of the high-risk list for the last three cycles. In 2019, GAO again affirmed that NNSA has enhanced its capability to estimate costs and schedules, to assess alternatives, and has implemented best practices in capital asset acquisitions. More importantly to the administrator and me, in the 2019 report, GAO specifically supported NNSA's argument to increase the statutory FTE cap, allowing us to hire more people. You can imagine having GAO support in this area was no small feat, and we did get cap relief after the 2019 report was issued. The 2014 Mies Augustine report to Congress highlighted that NNSA was bringing much needed discipline to project management. The just released 2020 NAS Snapper report called out APM as one of the organizational improvements saying, quote, this organization should be sustained and continually improved. The rigor it has brought to capital project management has saved billions of dollars and improved progress on the uranium processing facility at Y12 and the chemistry and metallurgy research replacement project at Los Alamos. Lastly, Congress has noticed our improvements. The 2014 HEWD report said, considerable reforms have been implemented to better understand the cost of NNSA programs to improve project management and to hold contractors more accountable. These fundamental contract and project management reforms have been sorely needed and will give NNSA tools that are critical for effective oversight. Moving on, in 2016, at the Hass Strategic Forces Subcommittee hearing, Congressman Cooper said, quote, on time and under budget. We rarely hear those words in Washington, but we're always grateful when we do. And finally, in 2016, SEWD Chair Senator Alexander at his hearing said, quote, it's important to point out over the last five years, the UPF project has gone from skyrocketing out of control to a managed process. Well, enough about the past. As we all know, in the project world, it's all about what have you done for me lately? As Dr. Verdon said when he spoke to you in July, we must modernize the nuclear security enterprises infrastructure. And you just heard Jim talk about the age of the infrastructure and the vital need to recapitalize it. NNSA infrastructure investments are unique in the federal government. As only in NNSA are our facilities the bulk of the industrial base needed to meet our mission. When the Department of Defense wants to buy a ship, submarine, or airplane, the private sector makes the investments necessary to ensure that they have the facilities to produce those platforms. Then the cost of their projects are subsequently recovered through the cost of the platform. Most recently, General Dynamics is making a $2 billion investment to have the plant capable to build uh, the Columbia class. There's no commercial industrial base to make nuclear weapons, to process plutonium, to design, disassemble, and assemble our weapons. We have to create those facilities. And in, more importantly, we have to get support for these projects independent of the weapons that they support through the appropriations process in the Congress. So today, NNSA has 12 major projects valued at $8 billion under construction. I'll discuss two of them quickly. The uranium processing facility at Y-12 is a $6.5 billion project that is 53% complete. We have 1,700 people working on it today and it will be finished in December 2025. It'll provide enriched uranium metal casting for our nation's nuclear weapons, oxide production for research reactors, beef stock for naval propulsion, and medical isotope feed material. Using our subproject strategy, it was broken down into seven subprojects. Three are completed, all under budget and ahead of schedule. The $65 million site readiness, $77 million site infrastructure, and $60 million substation. The $4.7 billion main processing building, the $1.2 billion salvage and accountability building, the $300 million mechanical and electrical building, 
and a $130 million process support facility are all under construction. We topped out the SAB on Monday, which means the last piece of structural steel was installed. Our next major milestone will be completion of the mechanical and electrical building in December of 2021. The CMRR building is a $2.2 billion project that performs analytical chemistry and metallurgy analysis to support our weapons program at Los Alamos National Laboratory. We broke this one up into six sub-projects. Two are complete, two are under construction, and two are under design. Now, I often tell people CMRR is the best kept secret in the NNSA. We have completed two nuclear projects there and the other two nuclear projects that are coming close to completion have all been completed under budget and ahead of schedule. We could have never said this a decade ago. Major projects under design include the lithium processing facility at Y12, which is a $1.6 billion um, facility to replace a very, very old and antiquated um, lithium capability. LPF will provide purification, processing, and salvage operations in a modern building built to current codes and standards. Design has just begun on this project. We are also designing the advanced sources and detectors project at the Nevada National Nuclear, I'm sorry, Nevada Nuclear Security Site. This is a $1.1 billion linear accelerator that will be installed 963 feet underground. Not too many people build facilities like that. This project is an enterprise-wide effort with design being done by all three of our national laboratories because they all have specialized expertise in what this linear accelerator needs to bring to the table to make sure that we can do the advanced testing and diagnostics to allow certification and reliability of the stockpile without nuclear testing. This is anticipated to be completed in 2025. We're building a new tritium finishing facility at the Savannah River site. Again, a $640 million project to replace some of Jim's old facilities that are beyond their useful life. And I think he's gonna be very happy that he can eliminate some large maintenance bills and big risks to his operational profile. Lastly, the surplus plutonium disposition project at Savannah River site is under design. This is a $640 million project that will meet our commitment to dispose of 34 metric tons of surplus plutonium. Design and early procurement of blow boxes is underway. Now, no NSA infrastructure update would be complete without talking about plutonium pit production. Consistent with the 2018 nuclear posture review, NNSA committed to producing no fewer than 80 pits per year by the end of 2030. In May of 2018, the Nuclear Weapons Council endorsed NNSA's path forward to recapitalize the production capability shuttered with the closure of Rocky Flats in the 90s. Our two-sided approach calls for pit production of at least 30 pits per year at Los Alamos and at least 50 pits per year at the Savannah River site. Each of these projects are identified in our FY21 budget request as multi-billion dollar efforts. We are nearing completion of the conceptual design for both projects on schedule and are on track to achieve CD1 in 2021. We have taken the lessons learned from UPF and CMRR to minimize risk and hopefully generate confidence in our ability to deliver them on budget and on schedule so Congress supports our budget request. Well, in closing, I want to tell you, when I go out to recruit construction professionals, I tell them that the NNSA builds the nation's most consequential, complex, and largest construction projects in the world, and nobody does it better than us. If you look at the most recent commercial nuclear bills in France, Finland, and even in the United States, projects that have gone over budget by factors of two and three and you compare them to our portfolio and what I've just described today, I hope you will agree. I believe the past is behind us. We provide credible estimates and schedules and we meet our commitments. Now there is lots more to be done and we are working to continuously improve, but I believe that NNSA has turned the corner in acquisition and project management. Some will say the task before the NNSA is too aggressive, 
But what I say to them is I am confident in the federal staff and contractor partners that we have assembled. I can tell you, I work with the smartest and most dedicated workforce that I've ever worked with in my career. We are working with the largest, most successful design and construction companies in the world. If our budgets are supported, I am confident that we will deliver on the commitments necessary to keep a strong, safe nuclear deterrent. With that, I thank you, and I am happy to answer any questions you might have. Well, Bob, uh, thank you. That's a great overview from you both about the current state of NNSA and what you've done to improve the infrastructure and modernization of the facilities. So I'm going to, um, as moderator and host, uh, ask the first question, and this is for you, Jim. Uh, as the person in charge of overseeing the safety policy for NNSA and executing many of the physical aspects of the facility, could you elaborate on the importance of modernizing your most basic infrastructure to maintaining a credible warhead sustainment and modernization effort, especially in light of the 80 bits per year goal, which um, Bob just recently talked about? Sure, uh, I'll be happy to. Uh, and I'll describe it in a couple of different ways. First off, a lot of the recapitalization that happens through my program is at the system and sometimes even the component level, as opposed to the, the overall facility. And, and often that has to do with the complex safety systems that we use for our high hazard work. There's no higher priority in NNSA than to ensure the safety of our workforce, the public and the environment. And, and so if one of those safety systems is unavailable, we will shut down the operation and put it in a safe condition. So, so if these safety systems don't uh, operate and aren't sustained, then our appropriate response is to sacrifice mission production. But we don't wanna do that obviously. And so we, we invest as needed in those systems to make sure that we have and can sustain our high reliability in the, the safety, both for, for nuclear safety and for industrial safety and things like high explosives. Let me give me a, a couple of examples of, of general purpose infrastructure and, and how that plays out. So the first one really has to do with, a few years ago, I, I actually worked at the Pantex plant in Amarillo, or outside of Amarillo. And I have vivid memory of walking from my car into the bays and cells and to go through the facilities there i would pass all of these broken down tattered facilities and, and there'd be caution tape wrapped around them and there would be all these warnings don't go here don't step there and the the a lot of the infrastructure really looked as bad as it was and then all these production technicians would finally get to the bays and cells at Pantex. And as soon as they walked in there, we would expect them to operate flawlessly. The, the, the amount of human error we, we allow in that kind of work is a fraction of what most industry experiences. And so, so we expect you know, absolute best out of our people and we, ought, we owe them an equivalent infrastructure and an equivalent, an equivalent work environment to, to be their best. The, the other example I'll give you is to ask you all to think about, because it's coming up perhaps, um, you know, whether you like going to the mall around Christmas to go shopping and what is the thing you least like about it? Well, for most of us, it's driving around the mall for 20 minutes to find a parking spot. Well, imagine if that was your experience every day going to work. You know, how, it's hard to retain the really high caliber people we want if, if they have to drive around and find a parking spot, which usually ends up, you know, a significant distance away from where they work. And some of the places where we have our, our facilities are, are not in the greatest, of, you know, either from heat or cold or whatever the case may be. So it's just not efficient and effective to operate this critical infrastructure and, and put so much of the burden 
on our workforce because we haven't provided the kinds of environments that quite honestly, the people of that caliber deserve. The second question I'm gonna turn over to Jeff. Jim, I, I believe it was you that, that mentioned um, the, the issue of, uh, of escorts to uh, escort uncleared individuals. Um, wondering how the security clearance process is uh, is working these days. It's kind of an ebbs and flows over the over the years of whether whether you have a huge huge pipeline ready to be cleared or not. Is that is that a factor in in uh, in trying to get cleared escorts? So, so neither neither Bob nor I are, are the security person, but but we we both pestered Jeff Johnson, who is in charge of security enough that I think we know the answer. If it, that there was a problem a year and a half ago, uh, right around the time when there were some 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 breaches in in people's personal ident information, but that that's not the case anymore. You know, for the most part, we're get the time it takes to go from bringing somebody into the organization to having them cleared to the level where they can do work is is relatively small now. But it's still, from, from a cost perspective, it's still pretty high. So the, the contractors that we're bringing in, the subs to do the work, it's it's not really financially viable to, to put all of them through the clearance process. So instead, we use the existing workforce to, to, be, to be escorts. The problem is that 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 workforce has either got something else to do for a day job or they're on overtime. So, so that's not cheap either. But if we can figure out how to get a cost-effective cadre of cleared people who can be these escorts, then we minimize the, the opportunity cost to our other workforce and the overall cost to the project because that cost is rolled into the project. And uh, I, I want to add something as well. So, you know, we, we're we a learning organization. When I was working in Italy, we had a real hard time getting our uh, Italian national employees on the base to do work. And so one of my junior officers said to me, hey, Skipper, what do you think? We just moved the fence. Well, that was a pretty cheap solution. And so rather than taking a couple of hours a day to get everybody inspected and cleared we spent a couple of thousand dollars and moved the fence line well we're doing that here now on some of our jobs we have a project at pantex right now that when i first came here we did a project and we had an escort and we spent nearly as much money in escorts as it did to do the construction project well now we're putting a security bubble fence around our site I can bring uncleared workers in. I only need a guard to watch the gate instead of everybody getting inspected. So I just make sure nobody comes outside of my secure area. Big savings, big smart thing to do. All we gotta do is think differently. Well, thank you for that. Uh, David, did you have a question with respect to the 2018 NPR mandate? In line with the 2018 NPR's mandate for NSA to modernize and improve its facilities, what are some of the current projects and specific areas that the NSA is prioritizing to bring the organization's infrastructure up to date? So, um, this is this is Reigns. I, I I went I went through that you know that listing of projects. I would tell you, uh, it's always safe to quote the administrator. Our top priority project are our pit production projects. We have to deliver 80 pits. We're gonna do that 30 at Los Alamos, 50 at Savannah River. We have made a very large budget investment, not only in, in the major capital work, but Jim and his team, um, Wayne Jones and the CIO team, uh, our security folks, all across the enterprise, you know, so some of the things that, that, that you see in the budget where we call out line items, you, we don't really see a lot of the other operational investments that are being made. There's also on the defense programs operation side where they're hiring, um, clearing and training people 
in order to be able to operate these plants when they come online. And so that, that's what I would say is our top priority. And uh, you know, if somebody wanted to go through the budget request and you add up everything that has plutonium in front of it, I think you would see those are the biggest infrastructure investments that we're making. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. Uh, whether you're, whether you're, you're just going through the, the line items or if you, you know, go all the way to the back and, and dig through the you know, hundreds of, of smaller projects, you'll see that, that there's no uh, larger focus than at Los Alamos. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for those uh, answers. I have a question here on for uh, both uh, uh, Bob and, and Jim. What does the NNSA need Congress to understand about the efforts you're undertaking, uh, particularly uh, for Congress to understand your schedule and budget? Uh, what are the things that they most, you think, need to understand that they don't uh, particularly understand today? I'm not sure that they don't understand it. I'm going to tell you what I tell everybody in, in um, major capital construction. Nothing is more important than a stable and predictable funding. We build our estimates, both cost and schedule, on a particular funding profile. The thing that I think is unique, again, to NNSA versus DOD, right? When DOD said, I'm going to build uh, the Gerald Ford, they got $12 billion. Actually, I think they got six and then it grew, okay? Um, I have to build UPF. I've said it's six and a half billion dollars since 2013. I get an annual appropriation every year for that. And if the money doesn't come on schedule, I have 1,700 people working, I have to lay them off. And so thank goodness the Congress understood that. And they have kept that thing financed. Some of our other projects that hasn't happened. Even when you know we're told that that a project is small enough for us to fully finance, like our HESC facility in in uh, Pantex, we fully finance that in the budget request. It was it was cut. I was going to award a construction contract for that next month. I have to wait until the 21 budget is in place because that's when the second half of the money comes into play for me. You know, we had planned that as a single project. It was not authorized for incremental funding. I can't award my fixed price construction contract. So as I said to you a little earlier, I carved out a small project to put in a fence and do some utilities infrastructure within the authorized amount that I have but I would have been much better off if I could have just awarded one construction contract, get in and get out faster. And so I'll go over to Jim for anything he would like to add. The one, and I put it into my discussion early on, it's a, it's a phrase I use fairly frequently. We didn't get into this situation overnight. It took 20 years to get to the position where we now have, unfortunately, some pretty significant block obsolescence of, of key facilities, both major facilities and and smaller um, support it's going to take us a long time to get out of it even with the the kinds of support that we've been thankful and and happy to to get in the last few years the the, the important thing is and it's not something that congress doesn't know it's it, the temptation to put this in the solved problem bucket we need to resist that because the, the kinds of support we're getting, we need that consistently and, and for for the foreseeable future, you know, consistent from, from one fiscal year to the next because of how all these projects are interconnected and and consistent, you know, years in, on end. But I think Congress knows that. David, you had a question about GPP threshold. If you'd like to. Yeah, I'll tell you on. what, what I'd like to do. I, in fact, there's a question here, Peter, from uh, from our audience. I, I'd like to take that one. I think it rolls right after the, the last one. Uh, we have a question from Patrick Rhodes of the National Strategic Research Institute. He asked, can you identify the top three or four risk factors 
that might cause NNSA not to meet its infrastructure modernization goals and then address how NNSA addresses those factors? Okay, so so the first risk is the thing we just talked about, right? If 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 we if we get insufficient funding, our funding starts to cycle back and forth, then it's hard to do the consistent long-range planning that, that that Bob's organization and mine do. The, the projects we, we work on take take years to plan, in some cases take years to come to fruition. Um, and 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 while I don't have a billion, a billion, any billion dollar project, when you add up the the 200 or so minor construction projects that, that are going on at any one time, that is several hundred million dollars. So keeping that consistent funding is, is first and foremost the, the most important thing. The other thing is just, for me at least, is, is just a fact of life. I, I, just, I alluded to this block obsolescence. You know, we went through 20 years where we really weren't recapitalizing on a year-to-year -year basis. So we ended up with a large percentage of our enterprise needing to be recapitalized all at the same time. Well, we don't have the resources or the capacity to fix everything at the same time. So we have to put things into risk uh, prioritization. And, and that's right and proper. And the tools I talked about, the science-based infrastructure tools to identify the importance of, a, of, a, of an asset to our mission, which we call it mission dependency index and to use the army corps of engineers builder program to help us figure out the likelihood that that asset's going to fail so we have probability of failure consequence of failure we have risk but we do that two years in advance because of the, of the normal budget cycles and so you know one of the one of the challenges i i have is is to make sure that we maintain the the performance, but also the flexibility that in case the facility that I thought was most at risk in the budget formulation period turns out not to be the one I need to fix in the budget execution year, that we can keep all that going. So, you know, that that's kind of an additional risk I would add from my perspective. And, uh, and on my end, I got a, a couple of others I would ask. The, the, the first one, is the atrophy of the nuclear supply base in the in the United States. The next one is critical construction staff skills, particularly in nuclear construction. We build a lot in this country. We don't build a lot of nuclear stuff. And a nuclear qualified welder or pipe fitter is much different than the person who's just, you know, doing standard commercial work. And then um, making sure that we have adequately trained and seasoned design staff, again, we're building a lot today, but we hadn't built a lot and designed a lot in the past. And so this is a muscle that you have to impose in standards. And so we need to make sure that the, you know, that our, that our designers are current. How are we fixing that? So we're, we're looking at potentially looking at the Defense Procurement Act Title III availabilities I talked with Dr. and his team to see if they're be able to get industrial base working for us on. Um, and then the last thing was we're on the on the construction staff, we're working on incentives, apprenticeships, and we've talked with our with our MO partners and with the FCOG on trying to see if we can generate a pipeline from people who once they once they get trained and qualified to be able to construct these facilities, because these are new missions, then we wanna entice them to stay at Savannah River, to stay at Los Alamos, to stay at Oak Ridge, to operate and maintain them through the life cycle. We think that's a win-win for them because they don't have to be, you know, be travelers for the rest of their lives and they might be able to settle down in, a, in an industry that they've proven to be really good at. Very good. I, I have one other one question that I'm going to try to combine too, is what would be the impact on your work if NNSA does not get the full funding you requested in 2021? The reason I ask that is I heard the they may very well get a the DR for the rest of the year. And I'm wondering what your impact would be on your programs if that was the case. Okay, so um, CRs are a way of life, and 
we understand that. And so, you know, we're inoculated for a period of about a quarter. If it's the whole year, you know, we'll be in trouble. So again, I go back to say, what has the department done? We are putting together an anomaly request, identifying how we would like the Congress, even under a CR, to be able to allow us to realign funds so that way, within available top line appropriations, we can put the, the resources where we need it. You know, so for example, when you have a CR, you're getting what the prior year's budget amount was. Well, I finished a couple of things with the 20 money. I don't need that in 21. And so we say, if you can take this amount of money and put it on these projects, which are new starts for us, which we're normally not allowed to do, then we can meet our schedule and budget commitments. It's very important for us, and I think our anomalies describe it, how these projects interrelate. As Jim said, you know, it doesn't make any sense to complete UPF if I didn't have the $70 million project that brought the power necessary to run UPF. And so if we can explain that and demonstrate, so Jim has a very important 138 KV project that he only had $6 million in the 20 budget and he's got you know $49 million in the 21 budget. I'm close. close. Uh, if I get 6 million, it doesn't help me. But if I can take some dead money on a project that's done and finance his, now I can provide the power for that $1.1 billion ASD project that I talked to you about, and all of those will complete together. And so we need to make sure that the Congress understands that all of our projects are interrelated, whether it's financed from Jim's account, Wayne Jones's account, or Dr. Verdon's account. A lot of the, re the requirements that, that we're working you know, the, the, the infrastructure exists in order to enable people to, to do the things that the nation needs, right? The products that come out of our wholly owned industrial enterprise. Th those needs don't change because there's a CR. Um, so, so what happens is that we just get squished into, into smaller time windows. But, but the planning we have right now, you know, is, is you, you got a need at a certain year. You, you, you know what it takes in an efficient and effective process to meet that need. You back it up and you get to whatever is needed in FY21 so that we can support pit production in FY25. Um, that the 25, 26, you know, 24, 25, 26 timeframe is going to stay the same. But if we slip, you know, if we slip the start dates or the middle, then we're, we're going to continue to, to get to the point where it's really hard to deliver efficiently and effectively. The other problem I have, and I, I hate you know, to be tongue in cheek, is I'm fighting the second law of thermodynamics, right? I got entropy. The, the facilities don't stop aging because we're under a CR. The things that fail still fail. Um, yeah. that, that those risks come about, you know, through, through nature independent of of the ability to deal with them. And you all know, and we're very thankful that right now we have, have a pretty um, that will allow us to do quite a bit of really important stuff now to enable success down the road. And and this lift that that the FY21 president's budget represents is crucial to our success you know, that has impacts for a decade. So, so yeah, we, you know, CRs are, are, are a way of life. They happen more often than not. We will, we will manage on a risk-based perspective as best we can, but the best thing is to not delay at all. I want to thank you both for taking questions from your host. And what I'd like to do now is open the session to our audience and uh, listening as a reminder, you can participate by uh, using the Q and A uh, uh, link, where you can it's a raise your hand function. And when I when I when we call on you, please unmute your mic 
and uh, state your name and affiliation for our guests uh, so they can answer your question. Uh, we do have a couple of questions. Uh, David has already answered one. There's another one here. Um, it's from uh, Rock Riser. Would you, uh, gentlemen, let us know how carefully do you mesh your budget with that of DOE as a whole so that there's not a, a disconnect between the two? Our alignment with the DOE budget, um, I mean, we, we work very, very closely with them. You know, I think, I think that, uh, you know, we are one Department of Energy. We're semi-autonomous, but... With DOE or DOD? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you said with DOE. With, with, with DOD, uh, you know, so really this is, this is a big thing that, that the administrator and Dr. Vernon talking with the Nuclear Weapons Council, making sure that, that we do a really good job articulating to them what we need to do to meet their needs. And so, you know, if, if they said I need 80 pits, I think that they're getting confidence that we can tell them what we need to do to make 80 pits for you. And here's what the bill is. And I think because of our most recent experiences of being able to deliver on that and not coming back saying, oh, wait a second, I need more, I need more, I need more it creates a, a more, I think, collaborative and collegial dialogue. And then they can go up to the hill together. I think it was very, very important when the NWC endorsed the pit production plan to the Congress. And my understanding is the Secretary of Defense also endorsed the pit production plan to the Congress. And our program in general. And our program, and I, I, so, and I think that th that those are improvements. You know, when I first came to DOE and NNSA, I used to hear about people saying, "You stole my money," but I don't hear that anymore. It's like, hey, we're working together to use the 050 budget to its best ability to meet both departments' missions. Thank you for those answers. I, I'd like to ask uh, Dan Leone, who has a question for us, to go ahead and. Uh, Unmute your mic there, Dan, and uh, uh, go ahead and address your question to either one of our speakers. Yeah, hi, good afternoon, everybody. Do you hear me okay? Yes, absolutely. Okay, great. Well, uh, David and um, Jeff, Peter, thank you all for, for having this. And uh, Mr. Raines, Mr. McConnell, thank you both for coming, even though I am here. Uh, I'm Dan Leone, I'm the editor of the Exchange Monitor. We cover the nuclear industry. So I, I got a couple of questions, I'll be quick. I'm curious, do we know yet when the final solicitation is going to come for the Y-12 and the Pantex recompete? It will be out shortly. And I can't, I, can't, I can't tell you the exact date because we have to get that through the acquisition processes I mentioned the other day. But I'm confident that what we will do is transition, as I said, you know, in the remarks the other day that you had written about that we will transition before this contract ends in September 21. Okay, the, the second question, uh, while this Y-12 Pantex recompete is happening, you all already preemptively made the decision that you're going to uh, keep the incumbent on so that they finish UPF and so that there's not uh, a jumble up, you know, and there's continuity while the thing's going back on the street and there's a transition. Well, at Savannah River on, on the primary side of the equation, it looks like there would be something similar happening. I'm wondering if you all had considered the idea of like keeping uh, the keeping SRNS on there to continue with the uh, Savannah River plutonium processing facility while they're doing their recompete. Is that is that an idea that's that you all have talked about and would consider? I I, I think perhaps you have a misunderstanding of what the the cns contract is that contract had two separate clins and so we're you know we're not you know not taking upf off of the contract for any reason we structured that contract forward thinking with the understanding that if there were a potential problem on the um, operations side that the CLIN2 construction project, which is distinct different with its own cost and schedule baseline, with its own contract requirements, that was a completion contract. 
So we never anticipated that that project would not continue with the incumbent contractor. So I, I, I think I think your premise going in was a little bit a little bit different. Yeah, Bob, the maybe Banner, it was too clever for my own good. I just meant is do you have that contractual mechanism available to you at Savannah River to avoid other no, disruption well, of continuity? No, at Savannah River, we're just coming up on critical decision one, which is identifying the scope, the cost, and the schedule. We will just have completed conceptual design. And so we have a wealth of abilities to determine what the final acquisition structure would be for the construction of the pit production facility there. And so no decisions have been made on that, but you know, again, to, to try to make an analog between the two sites, I think is, is kind of a stretch, Dan. Okay, that's fair, Bob, I understand. Thanks very much. Yes, sir. I have just one other thing. I was seeing my friend John Harvey, who is here, a former official at NSA and the Department of Defense and OSD. I was wondering, John, if you have any questions you would like to ask our speakers before they have to leave. Thanks, uh, Peter. Uh, I think this one is for Bob. Uh, hi, folks. Uh, Bob, this, was in, this one is in the weeds a bit. Uh, with regard to Los Alamos and plutonium, you're upgrading this rad lab to be able to uh, have more material at risk so that it can do more and partly partially fill the role of the CMRR facility that has been uh, gone down. My question to you is that it's going to cost several hundred million dollars to get that facility up to be able to handle that situation is, is what I understand. My question is, given that the rad lab was designed conservatively to meet many of the requirements of a, ha a ha hazard category three facility, why is it gonna cost so much money to get that thing up to be able to handle 400 grams of plutonium? My second comment oh. is, okay, go on, Bob. Yeah, so um, I, again, I wanna make sure that maybe we're all talking on the same page. The, the Rad Lab upgrade and the installation of equipment in PF4 is what is $2.2 billion. And so there's gonna be more than a billion dollars worth of work inside of PF4, and then the other billion dollars was on the RAD lab. So it's not a multi-billion dollar effort. No, I said hundreds I of millions for the RAD lab is what I understood, yeah. but I'm surprised, right. David, I'm I, surprised I, at that number for, for the RAD lab. I mean, given that it was designed and so, for well, hazard category three. So, so I heard you say it's in the in the weeds, and I don't I don't want to I don't want to be argumentative, but that's what it costs to buy NQA one components, NQA one equipment. The Rad Lab is currently an operating facility, and so there's a lot of safety and security issues that we have to do. Um, un, unlike a greenfield, um, regular Navy construction project or something, what we build into, into our construction project costs, this is, again, unlike any place else, the training of the workforce, the commissioning and startup for the workforce. So, you know, when, again, when the Gerald Ford was delivered, $12 billion, that was the ship back in the ocean. And now they're going to be out there in a train, 5,000 sailors, how to run and operate that thing. Those costs are $12 billion. All right. Now, for us, the cost to hire, train, certify, all of that is in the cost. And so while, you know, while you might say, hey, I know what a glove box costs and I know what these costs, I think, I think when people have a fuller understanding of what everything is that goes into our project. And so... Again, in DOD, when you say, oh, here's the cost of a building, $500 million, that's a construction cost. For us, it's all the NEPA, it's all the planning at the front, it's all the design. And so we have a yeah, little bit good. different, so hopefully that answered your question, John. Uh, thanks for that count clarification. I really appreciate it. I also want to say as somebody who worked with Norm and Rich on their report in 2014 that was referred to earlier, 
Uh, it is very gratifying to see the progress that has been made over the last five years at NNSA in program management and in particularly the management of the capital project. So congratulations, you guys. Well, thank you. I hope I hope I quoted you guys accurately. I did take it right out of the report. So thank you so much. I appreciated the opportunity and look forward to working with you again. Well, I, let me just say to Bob and Jim, thank you so much for your uh, graciousness in coming on to talk with us. And we have come to the end of this forum uh, with this um, of the National Nuclear Security Administration. And I wanna uh, thank our sponsors. I certainly wanna thank our co-hosts, David and Jeff. And we'd also like to thank the NNSA staff and the Mitchell staff that made all this possible. And to the two, our two speakers and to our audience, from those, all of us here from the, at the Mitchell Institute. Have a great aerospace power kind of day and we will talk to you soon. And we will have the next session on Monday with Madeline Creedon and Bill Ostendorf. Again, thank you all very much. Thank you, David and Jeff. Thank and you. Thank you everybody. Thank you to our two great speakers. Appreciate it, thanks so much. Thank, thank you for the opportunity. Have a great day.